So the advocate's topic is that I'm refuting is euthanasia, and his main claim is euthanasia in the form of voluntary physician-assisted suicide should be made an available option for those suffering from a terminal illness. He continued on by explaining that euthanasia is the act or practice of killing or permitting the death of hopelessly sick or injured individuals. He also explains that passive euthanasia is holding back treatment and allowing that patient to die, and active euthanasia is the use of lethal substances. The advocate backs up his main claim with the supporting claims that first, terminally ill patients have the right to die at their own terms, and second, we should make it a legal option for those that face the end of their lives. He backs up his first claim that terminally ill patients have the right to die at their own terms by saying that people have control over their own lives and the choice is not owned by the society, but rather by the individual. First, I would like to start with the advocate's main claim that euthanasia in the form of voluntary assisted suicide Voluntary physician-assisted suicide should be made an available option for those suffering from a terminal illness is not a claim of fact argument, it is a claim of policy. My main claim is that euthanasia is contradictory to the role of doctor's performance in our community. In response to his first supporting claim that terminally ill patients have the right to die at their own terms, his reasoning is flawed. The advocate uses all claims of value to persuade the audience into legalizing euthanasia. My supporting claim is doctors perform acts of healing and saving the lives of others, not allowing the patients to be killed willingly. The advocate uses that people have control over their own lives and that the choice is owned by the individual, not the society. These are flawed also because people cannot control that they are terminally ill and need to be admitted to the hospital. Um, they do not need to be injected with a lethal substance for their pain to end. People technically don't have control over their own lives or things such as cancer and AIDS would not exist in our society. Also, the individual does not have to be injected with a substance in order for the pain to be relinquished. Doctors have medications such, such as Oxycontin, MS cotton, and fentanyl patches made available for their clients to take when they are in pain. The American Medical Association is also against euthanasia by stating, doctors perform a crucial act of healing and saving lives. Accepting a dual role of taking life while at the same time protecting life would undermine their credibility and the sacred trust that exists between a patient and a doctor. The advocate also uses a personal experience to back up his claim. He uses his grandfather as an example by saying that the doctors gave his grandfather large amounts of morphine so that he could have a peaceful death. Although it is a nice personal example, claim of facts can only be backed up by other claim of facts and factual information. As a response to the advocate's second supporting claim, that we should make it a legal option for those that face the end of their lives, this statement is also a claim of policy informing the audience what should happen. He supports it by saying that we should make it a legal option for those and that keeping a person alive can be torture for the patient. My responding claim is legalizing euthanasia will cause lawsuits worldwide and leave many physicians out of practice. The advocate's reasoning is once again flawed when he states that we should make it a legal option for those and, keeping, and that keeping the person alive would be torture for a patient. If we legalize euthanasia, it would not only be for people who are terminally ill. There are many definitions for the word terminal. Um, some persons that are diagnosed terminally ill do not die for years. Some people that are diagnosed terminally ill, or some define terminal illness as being a hopeless condition where severe physical or psychological pain or physical or mental debilitation or deterioration is no longer acceptable to the individual. That would make it possible for just about anyone who has suicidal impulses to die under euthanasia. Also, if the pain is unbearable for the patient, there are many alternatives for medications that a person can take for the pain to subside. If euthanasia became legal and the patient allowed for the physician-assisted suicide, if the family didn't know about this, they could bring the doctor to court and that doctor could go to jail for second-degree manslaughter. Second-degree manslaughter is the act of killing a person in a manner less culpable than murder. This would be a voluntary manslaughter, so if the doctor was charged guilty for this act, he could spend up to 15 years in prison for killing an adult and up to 30 years in prison for killing a child. An example that might cause a doctor a lawsuit would be an elderly person in a nursing home who could barely understand their breakfast menu and is asked to sign a form consenting to be killed. Would this be voluntary or involuntary? How would they be protected by the law at all? Right now, this overall prohibition on killing stands in the way. Once just one signature can sign away a person's life, nothing can be as strong, can be as strong of a protection as the current absolute prohibition on direct killing. In closure, the advocate claims that euthanasia in the form of voluntary assist, 
physician-assisted suicide should be made an available option for those suffering from terminal illness, and that was a claim of policy. And my claim is that euthanasia is contradictory to the role of a doctor's performance in our community, backed up by my supporting claims that legalizing euthanasia will cause lawsuits worldwide and leave many physicians out of practice, and also doctors perform acts of healing and saving the lives of others, not allowing the patient to be killed well. All right, you identify the topic very clearly in the claim. Uh, you kind of recap what the definitional issues were, and since they don't really become all that controversial, I think maybe you could skip over that. Then you highlight what the secondary points are. That's good. It's very clear where you're going there. Uh, you signpost the first point. You argue that it's a policy claim. Uh, and you suggest that there's a counterclaim of fact that we ought to be applying in this situation. I think that counterclaim of fact needs to come up repeatedly in your argument because that's the criteria by which you want us to judge uh, the advocate's claim of policy that you're talking about. I thought you had a good discussion of why the advocate's criteria were value-based and that that's problematic in this particular context. Um, I, I've mentioned in a couple of places, I think there's a little bit too much reading in your presentation. You need to talk to the audience a little bit more and explain the issues. Um, it sounds like you're, one of the problems, this is, the, this is a problem that you're going to have with these arguments, almost everybody's going to have, because you've done this interesting analysis, you've done all of these uh, reasoning things that you're trying to apply to things, and you've written them out, and they all, all look great when somebody's reading it, but when you're explaining it orally, you really have to simplify the point and say, here's the problem with this issue, and you can't just use a shorthand about... Um, well, there's an amphiboly sitting there or something like that, because uh, you don't know that your audience is going to understand those things. And I thought that you needed to have a little bit more explanation on a couple points like that. Uh, when you got to the second issue, it was listed very clearly. Again, you had a couple of counterclaims that I thought were pretty clear. Uh, they are counterclaims to policy arguments, so you are getting on the brink of making some policy arguments yourself. You do kind of poise them as... Uh, hypothetical claims of fact, so I think you get away with a little bit on that. Um, I thought you needed a little bit more development on an earlier point about the pain relief argument, and I think you need a little bit more development on this point also about the, um, the nature of uh, people getting you know, um, euthanasia inadvertently or against their will. You've got a couple of hypotheticals on this, but that's about as far as it goes. It would be a stronger argument <laughs> Kazunheit, if you had some illustrations or data about how those kinds of things actually happen, or authorities, you know, doctors or uh, policy specialists who've written about this and say you can't really create the kind of check that would make sure that it's not involuntary or somebody's not being exploited or something along those lines. As it is, it's, you've got an interesting hypothetical, but that's about as far as it goes with the proof on that. All right, thank you for getting us started. I